Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the John Adams. My name is Tracy Metz. I'm the director of this small but august cultural institution that brings the best and the brightest of American thinking to the Netherlands. How often does it happen that as the director of a cultural institution, you have the opportunity to express the theme of the evening in your clothes? <laughs> I thought, this is my one chance. I'm going to go for it. This is the most bling thing I have in my cupboard. So this evening, I'm wearing my bling thing in homage to the book by Lauren Greenfield. And this is the book. Gold silk, 500 some pages. It is a monumental work. I cannot tell you how thrilled I am to have Lauren with us this evening. Uh, just a couple opening remarks. We'll be moving on quickly through our program because Lauren has to leave early this evening or on time to be in the Airtale Late Night Show, which of course we're very happy about. Uh, that means that we'll be stopping at 9.15 so that there's still time to sign because that's also an important moment. Um, I want to start by thanking some people. I want to thank, first of all, Lauren's publisher, Faden. Orla is here from London and Tycho Corbet from Feiden, Netherlands. Thank you so much for making this happen and thank you so much, I know also on behalf of Lauren, for having the faith in this project that just kept getting bigger and bigger. And you stuck with her and rightly so because it is really a spectacular work. I also want to thank the Lloyd Hotel for hospitality in uh, putting Lauren up. Um, and I also want to mention that in September of next year, if I'm not mistaken, Wim van Sinderen, the director of the Fotomuseum in Den Haag, that uh, Lauren will be having an exhibition in the Fotomuseum. September, is that right? September 2018. September 2018. Yeah. OK. Well, I'm sure we'll all be there, but it's a while away. So <laughs> <laughs> remind us in the meantime, Wim. <laughs> um, Lauren first garnered public recognition with her project in 1997 called Fast Forward, Growing Up in the Shadow of Hollywood. And perhaps uh, good to know that her work particularly interests me since we're both from Los Angeles. Then she made Fuhrer again with her project Girl Culture, and I'm sure you all know her fantastic clip for always, hashtag like a girl. And then, of course, there was the movie that was shown here, I believe, in 2015 on the Fepero, The Queen of Versailles, an absolutely extraordinary document. And now there's this book, which is the fruit of 25 years of photography of not just wealthy people, but about wealth, about people's relationship to wealth and wealth as an aspirational thing. A lot of people act wealthy who aren't, which I think has a lot to do with the huge rising debt in, uh, in the US. And there are some photos in this book that are such extraordinarily mind-boggling examples of unbelievably bad taste. <laughs> How about the replica of the White House of a billionaire in China? How about the Louis Vuitton patterns on the artificial leg of a lady who had lost her leg? And above all, how about the little tiny night evening bag in the shape of a McDonald's bag of french fries with Swarovski crystals. I put a picture of it on Twitter and I thought everybody would think, oh my god, oh horrible. All these women react to saying, oh, where can I buy it? <laughs> so we're not immune to this either. Um, the book also is, is, is full of anecdotes. One that really stuck with me was uh, a child of uh, one of the billionaires who's in the book um, who decided uh, that they would, I think it was the, the couple that uh, uh, built the house, Versailles, and they took a regular commercial jetliner and one of the children said, Mommy, who are all those strangers on our plane? <laughs> and this is a bubble. It's a big bubble and it's also an aspirational bubble and that's what makes it so interesting. Lauren herself has called it a global morality tale, and it really is about our times, about the 
the fundamental shift of values in the U.S. from thrift and frugality to keeping up with the Kardashians. Ladies and gentlemen, Lauren Greenfield. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here at John Adams and to speak with Tracy. And um, yeah, today I'm going to share work from Generation Wealth. And we're so excited. It's, go it's in LA now, the show. It's going to New York. And we're so excited to bring it to The Hague. And um, this project, as Tracy said, is a culmination of a 25-year documentary exploration through my photography, interviews, and films. And over the last four years, I've been engaged not only in making new work for the project in photographs and video, but most importantly, in a process of analyzing and investigating my own work, thinking about what I've been witness to over the last 25 years, the themes I've been drawn to and why, and what it all means. And to this end, I went through over a half a million pictures from my archive with the help of the curator, Trudy Wilnerstack. This is Limo Bob, who has the biggest limos in the world. So the first thing to clarify is that the project is not about actual wealth. It's about the influence of affluence. It's about the pervasive aspiration to wealth, its connection to our identity, and that of the American dream, and the way it's emulated, packaged, and our concepts of it are exported, and the contagious virus that is the addictive cycle of consumerism. This is a mall in Los Angeles where you can live at the mall. You can buy an apartment at the mall. <laughs> and in the context of this new American dream, my work considers wealth very broadly defined. So I am including the currency of fame, the currency of branding, the currency of the body, the currency of youth. Of course, I'm also talking about the currency of having money. And what that brings, um, this is Brett Ratner and Russell Simmons uh, with the cash they need for lunch in St. Bart's. But just as importantly, I'm looking at the value of looking like you do, the concept of fake it till you make it, as Future the Rapper and many other subjects told me. In this work, I've really tracked a kind of seismic shift in American values, going from a culture influenced by the Protestant ethic that prized hard work and frugality and discipline to a culture of bling, celebrity, and narcissism. And to illustrate that, I've got two pictures. On the left is one of my first pictures from a project I did on the French aristocracy in 1987, where I was, it was my first project out of college, and I was really looking at the values of old money and this world where class was not defined by money, which as a girl who's, who grew up in LA was kind of a point of contrast from what I saw in, my, in, in the city I grew up in where class was really defined by money. And of course, a big contrast to what I've been documenting. On the right is Suzanne, a Toronto socialite who's kind of a modern princess for me. Um, she's wearing Val Valentino, her favorite designer. And um, her fashion and design inspiration is a character from Chitty Chitty Bang Bang, Truly Scrumptious. <laughs> and here she is in one of her four seasonal closets. Um, and the orange boxes are the Hermes Birkin bags that she has in every color. As I was putting this work together and contemplating the iconic elements that represented this sea change, I kept thinking about the recurring Birkin bag which for people who happily don't know is an Hermes designer bag that costs five digits. And how this oft-repeated reference from unexpectedly diverse subjects throughout the world was just kind of kept coming up again and again. And besides the surprising knowledge about a five-digit bag, I also became obsessed by the fact that Kim Kardashian, who I first photographed at 12 years old, became a mainstream star by starting with a sex tape. Here she is at a party. Actually, when I was doing my first work, I, this was taken for that, but it wasn't in my book because Kim Kardashian wasn't anybody at that time. So part of it was kind of going back through the work. And of course, Kim became a driver of a lot of the kind of trends I followed. Kim is on the left, and then that's Courtney in the middle. 
And here she is 16 years later um, with the paparazzi. And one of the big kind of changes that I saw was um, our at kind of who we compare ourselves to and how our aspiration has changed. And one of the things that happened is that the American dream used to kind of center around comparing yourself with your neighbor and aspiring to having a little bit more like the, the, the neighbor had a little bit better house than you did. But as we've kind of started to spend more time with the media and gotten to know these characters more than our neighbors, our reference group has changed so that keeping up with the Joneses becomes keeping up with the Kardashians. And the other thing I was obsessed with, or more recently, kind of towards the end of the project, was the gilded furniture and Corinthian columns that are the favorite aesthetic of our president, who's apparently putting gold drapes in the White House. And while this work is not just about the Birkin bag, Kim Kardashian, or the rise of Donald Trump, it is most definitely about the culture that made all three possible. And I'm going to represent Trump today with David and Jackie Siegel, um, who have a lot, in, David Siegel has a lot in common with, with Trump, um, principally the aesthetic in this picture. But when the financial crash happened in 2008, and I was making a movie called The Queen of Versailles, and this billionaire family who was trying to build the biggest house in America, a 90,000 square foot palace inspired by Versailles, when they were over leveraged and hit by the financial crash and their story turned into kind of a supersized foreclosure story, I realized that all of the stories I had been covering since the early 90s were connected. I'm going to show you a short video that I made for the exhibition. <laughs> definitely couldn't build them fast enough. It seems like it's never enough. You constantly need something. The greatest thing in life is to be a star. We never sought out to build the biggest house in America. It's just, it, it's like kind of happened. financial crash happened in 2008, I realized that the stories that I had been telling since the early 90s about consumerism and about materialism and how that had become part of the American dream, that they were all connected. How we had overextended, how we had bitten off more than we could chew. And that morality tale extended to all of us. And so I started working on this project called Wealth, bringing them together, thinking about what was the bigger story over these 25 years, about our cultural transformation, about how we had changed, about how materialism had become part of this dream, and about how, in the end, it was an empty dream. So before I tell you about what I discovered from this meta story, um, that's an excerpt, it's just the beginning, but um, I want to tell you a little bit about my own culture and background and what brought me to this investigation. So this is me at three. I grew up in kind of hippie times in Venice, California, and my parents were professors and influenced by the counterculture. Uh, my uncle's here tonight and can attest to that. Um, and my mom was doing cross-cultural field work in a Maya village in Mexico when I was little. Here I'm three. And I studied photography and visual anthropology at Harvard and began as an intern for National Geographic. And I did my first project with my mother in a Maya Indian village in Chiapas. And while I was there, I realized that as I was struggling with the language and with the access in a place where people did not want to be photographed, I realized that I didn't have the intimate access or understanding to really say something meaningful about what I was seeing. And I started thinking about the world I had grown up in, Los Angeles, and how LA youth culture was being exported all around the world with shows like Beverly Hills 90210 and 902, yeah, 10. And I realized that 
it, the, this world of kind of jaded excess and um, kind of over the top materialism that I had been introduced to at the end of high school was really worthy of the same kind of serious study that anthropologists and photojournalists often give to foreign cultures. So in the 90s, I went back to my high school in Santa Monica. This is from the solemn ceremony of graduation. <laughs> and started investigating my own culture. And the work really became about how kids were growing up quickly in the media-saturated environment and how they were influenced by the values of materialism and the cult of celebrity and the importance of image. And this was one of the first pictures I made at, at my school. And I, these seventh grade boys said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm doing a project about growing up in LA. And they said, so then you have to photograph money. That's what it's all about and they held up their dollar bills. And when I got back to my studio and looked at the pictures under a loop, I realized they were holding up $100 bills, and these were 13-year-olds. This was from Beverly Hills High Senior Beach Day, and I started doing interviews with the kids that kind of continued all the way through, and Mijanu in the foreground was voted best physique at Beverly Hills High. And while the picture kind of looks like the California dream, in her interview she talked about how hard it was, that she actually did not come from a rich family, and how hard it was to kind of compete in that world, and how she kind of found popularity because of her beauty. So the work on body image really started then, and also kind of the fake it till you make it. This is Emily, who was 10, who was living in a $3,000 a night suite at the Peninsula Hotel for three months when I took this picture. It was actually slumming it for them because their, their two mansions had been seized by the feds and her dad was indicted for tax fraud and ended up doing six years in prison. And on this day, she shaved her legs for the first time. And this is Adam, who's 13 at a bar mitzvah party where the parents rented out a nightclub on the Sunset Strip and brought in go-go girls to dance with the kids. And in Adam's interview, he said you have to have a, a you have to spend like $50,000 on a bar mitzvah or you're shit out of luck. But then he also said that he thought money ruined kids and he thought money ruined him and his parents thought that also and so they sent him to camp every summer in Michigan so he could learn how to be normal. But the, the kids and the subjects in the pictures kind of being the best storytellers of the values of their world and often the best social critics was something that stayed with the work. And this is another picture of Adam smoking a cigar out of a limo on a way to a concert. Um, and I show this picture because I wanted to show the similarity with um, Michael Douglas playing Gordon Gecko in, um, in the second Wall Street movie. And, one of the things when I started looking back and seeing what had happened over the 25 years, I realized it wasn't just the beginning of my work and I happened to be there at this time, but it was also that all of these things had kind of changed in that period. And, and I think representing one of them was Gordon Gecko and in the movie Wall Street when he declared greed is good and that was meant to be kind of ironic and he was meant to be a villain and for a generation on Wall Street, he became a role model, including Jordan Belfort, who was the wolf of Wall Street, and Florian Holm, who you heard saying, I love money, who um, was a huge hedge fund banker in Germany worth $800 million and then lost everything after defrauding investors and being um, indicted and being on the FBI's most wanted list and going to prison. And in this story, he kind of becomes kind of a truth teller because he's so smart and he kind of realized the error of his ways in the crash. And, uh, and Future, the rapper, who was the original kind of fake it till you make it. He pretended he had money before he had money and in his case it actually worked out for him. This is Jackie Siegel and her maid. And I show this picture because um, to kind of make the point that Americans admire the rich rather than resenting them because they always imagine that will be them someday. And I'm going to show you a clip from a film that I made called Kids and Money, which kind of points to the other trend I was following, which was branding as identity and the rise of consumer goods. I love fashion because I see it as 
like an art form like it's just a way to look good and make you feel good and to say something about yourself so you know when you're meeting someone they already know something about you from just what you're wearing I mean there's like a lot of different type of people like fashion wise at our school like of or course just in general just yeah but like I guess there's some people who don't really care that much and you can kind of tell <laughs> or it's true there are like just extreme amounts Four, of money at our school and Fortune uh, 500 yeah it, yeah like trust so. fund and so some of these people like really go overboard with the whole like everything sometimes I feel like it's more of a way of showing how much money you have than expressing yourself through style Going to the things that are four digits, I think that's very inappropriate for school. Yeah, for school. It's, it's not really necessary to spend a couple grand on something you're just wearing to go to class yeah. in. But if you want like a really nice classic bag, it's definitely appropriate to spend that kind of like four digits because that's something that's really nice. <laughs> so I started this journey in L.A., but I realized pretty quickly that this was not an L.A. story, that L.A. was kind of the bellwether of what was happening all over. And there was this kind of huge rise in consumer goods in the 90s. And the, I have these four pictures um, to kind of show how it was everywhere. On the top left is a 16-year-old in her room in San Francisco. On the top right is the garage of a DJ where he keeps his shoes. On the bottom left is Suzanne again, whose four seasonal closets were not big enough, and so she took over the wine closet and made it into another shoe closet. And then on the bottom right is a Filipino-American kid in the, in the suburbs of LA who has so many shoes, his mom says he's like Imelda Marcos. <laughs> and one of the things that was a really important piece of this was that this was not about rich people and not even middle class people, that there was this kind of striving in that crossed race, that crossed income level, that crossed border that I was documenting. And, um, and that in a way, the other thing that happened over these 25 years was less social mobility than ever before. And so for a lot of people, this kind of fictitious social mobility was the only social mobility available. And I'm gonna show you a short clip from a film I made called Magic City about a strip club in Atlanta. Poor people are the ones that spend the most money on the $700 shoes, the ones that don't have it. It's about exclusivity. Can you call up and get you a pair of the fresh Giuseppe's, or do you get to go in the back of the Versace store and shop? It's all about status right now. It's the new uh, uh, you know, doctor in front of your name. New doctor in front of your name. So this was a Hong Kong socialite. I thought she had put um, a religious symbol on the back of her neck only to find out it was the logo of her favorite fashion brand, Chrome Hearts. <laughs> so global branding and fashion became a big part of the story, and this is in Milan um, at Prada. And one of the things that I was also documenting was the precocious sexualization of girls and kind of how girls are sold to, how they're marketed to, and also how they're commodified. And this is an Italian teenager in Zara in Milan, and a five-year-old in a shop in LA where she came out of this, um, she came out of the dressing room, this is her favorite store, and she said, Dad, what do you think? And he said, great, I always wanted my daughter to look like a street walker. <laughs> and the literal and metaphorical fall on a fashion runway in New York. And Disney being kind of the best seller of, uh, princess and, and the idea of what it takes to be the perfect girl and from cradle to grave and you can get married as a princess. And Christina, who's getting married here, is not from a rich family. She works at Walmart and this was her dream. And this is a beauty pageant girl, winner, whose mother decided that the way to really knock everyone out and win the beauty pageant was to wear a showgirl outfit. But she said that she, she did not see any similarity between that and a Las Vegas showgirl. This is in a strip club in Las Vegas. And Tammy Boom, both of them spend literally thousands of dollars on each outfit. 
And one of the things I was also looking at with the media exposure was this idea of uh, pornification of the culture. And this is Sheena, a teenager um, in a dressing room in San Jose, who's kind of a very typical teenager and yet uses her sexuality to get attention. And in her interview, she said, if I could be anything, I would be a topless dancer, because I know if I can do that, I can do anything. And I was really surprised to hear that from a teenager with that occupation is not in her family at all. Um, but it kind of started clicking when I, um, I then saw kids at Fat Camp, which is a weight loss camp in the Catskills, they call Fat Camp, dancing like strippers when there were no counselors there. And then um, also saw that in the gyms, the kind of upscale gyms of LA and New York, there was a new sport called cardio striptease, or pole dancing aerobics, where soccer moms and teenagers can learn how to dance like strippers. Actually, Jackie Siegel also has a pole in her closet, and Limo Bob has poles now in his limos. So it was kind of like I was, I was looking at, well, if girls learn from a young age that their value is in their body, what's the logical conclusion? And I took it to its conclusion with the next subject, Brooke Taylor. My name is Brooke Taylor. We are at the world famous Moonlight Bunny Ranch, and I am a legal prostitute, a professional. Brooke Taylor is a college educated girl from a nice middle class Midwestern family who saw the cat house on HBO and was like, that looks like a good life, I want that, and then went and did it. I was a case manager for adults with developmental disabilities, and I was making, I think, oh, I think I was making like around 18, 20,000 a year. Pennies. How does that compare with what you make here? <laughs> make that in a day here. <laughs> I try to study sales, because that's basically what my job is, a sales job. I'm going to pitch my idea to the CEO of a company, and I'm hoping that he'll invest in my products. We all have to work for a living. We're all using our bodies for something. Just now when I get off work, my feet don't hurt. Other body parts do. <laughs> it's not the scarlet letter, it's the badge of honor. It's about the money you make and the lifestyle you have. So if, if, if girls' value is in their bodies, then there was a huge imperative to keep that value at any cost. And there's a chapter in the book that looks at aging. And this is um, Jackie Goldberg, who won Miss Senior LA County. And here she is having um, collagen to get ready for the pageant. And I, I kind of looked at the, the makeover as the new American dream. That this is after a facelift in a luxury recovery center. And the body used to be kind of like the genetic lottery, and what you got was what you lived with. But in our time, it was really the expression of success. And with technology and money and effort, you could transform yourselves. It was kind of like the new rags to riches story. And not limited to people, this is a Doberman after a facelift. <laughs> you can see the jowls are gone. Um, so Jackie Siegel from the Queen of Versailles, she had a similar story in that she was really smart. She went to RIT for engineering at a time where there weren't a lot of women there. And she realized at a young age that she could get further ahead in terms of where she wanted to go as a beauty queen than as an engineer. So she married timeshare King David Siegel and um, they ended up building the biggest house in America. And one of the things that I was interested in is the fact that starting in the 90s, we start to see imagery of rich people on TV much more and start to think that, that, that more people have planes and pools and maids than they actually do. And that stimulates the desire. This is Jackie after four boob jobs. Um, and when the New Yorker wrote about the Queen of Versailles, they said her breasts were an expression of the overabundance of the time. And this is her Aunt Sue, who lost her leg in a tragic accident, and Jackie wanted her to have a Louis Vuitton leg. <laughs> so I'm going to show you a short clip from the movie The Queen of Versailles, which was really like the kind of quintessential American dream consumerism story, because Jackie had a 26,000 square foot starter mansion, 
and that wasn't enough. bathroom three bedroom house and I can remember I would have to wait in line to use the bathroom in this house we have I think 17 bathrooms in our new house we have 30 bathrooms so I would, <laughs> you don't have to keep your legs pressed very long the reason why we really want the bigger home for one thing I think my husband deserves it I think it'd be a, like a lifetime achievement I think he's worked so hard and even though this house, which is 26,000 square feet, is so big, we're bursting out of the seams. I'm gonna go look at our new house, okay? and we saw Versailles, and we were inspired by the French architecture. I drew it on the back of an envelope on my way to Las Vegas. In Las Vegas, we looked out our window, and we kind of copied the top three floors of the Paris Hotel. Probably should have used smaller envelopes because it turned out to be the largest home in America. We never sought out to build the biggest house in America. It's just, it, it's like kind of happened. This is so This beautiful. is our grand ballroom. We have the grand staircase on each end. Mm -hmm. It's the palace. Can you imagine, like, the dances and the parties? I said, well, I'd like to have a bowling alley. And then he says, I want a health spa. And then I said, we need maid's quarters. I forgot how many kitchens, 10 kitchens. We have a sushi bar. Two tennis courts, one will be a stadium court. But this is our ice skating slash roller rink. The children have their own wing. They have a playroom with a stage where they can perform and do their little whatever they do. Okay, this is the staircase that I would come up if I was going to visit the children. We want to put everything that we could dream of in this home. That's our observation deck. Every night we go up there to watch the Disney fireworks. So by the time we both got what we wanted, now it's 90,000 square feet. Jackie, this is your room. No, that's not my room. Where's your room? That's my closet. Uh, no way. No way. I gotta go kiss my dog. My husband knew how special Chanel was to me, so he had her stuffed for me. And now she's upstairs. <laughs> and this one, a staff member ran over a pen yeah. in the driveway, but now he's on my piano. <laughs> So you ask me why I'm building the largest home in America? And my answer is because I could. You mentioned being a kingmaker and having a big role in the 2000 election. I sure did. I got George W. elected president. Personally, got him elected president. It is nice to be here with so many good folks from the great state of Florida. <laughs> Had I not stuck my big nose into it, um, it would have probably wouldn't have been an Iraqi war. <laughs> And maybe we might have been better off, I don't know. How were you personally responsible for the re-election? I, I, I'd rather not say it, because it may not necessarily have been legal. They also supported Donald Trump, and uh, after he won, David said it was the best thing that had happened to him since he discovered sex. So when, they, when their house, this was their house after it was in foreclosure, I, I, I realize that if they even they could kind of over leverage, over dream, over extend, that this was um, a big kind of global story. And, um, and this is a, a development kind of near them. And basically everybody had these kind of media driven fantasies of being rich and in the age of cheap credit they could fulfill them. And this was um, a modest house where the people pulled out more than the value of their house to build a replica of their favorite resort in Maui. And then this is what happened afterwards. And I saw this from California, Ireland, Dubai, and 
Iceland. This was in Iceland where people abandoned their cars because they realized after the crash that they could go to debtor's prison. And this was in Dubai. They did a development called the World Islands where for $10 million you could buy a piece of dredge sand in the ocean without electricity, without sewage, without water. And this was bought by an Irish developer who was going to build the island of Ireland. And a couple of months after the crash, he killed himself. And this was a fisherman in Iceland who got swept up in the boom like so many people in Iceland did, became a banker, and then got fired and after the crash went back to being a fisherman. But in Iceland, they really used the crash as a way to kind of recalibrate. They felt like they had lost their moral compass. They wanted to get back to their values. They wanted to get back to nature, to fish. And so the fishermen said, you realize what matters. And they literally went back to their knitting. They decided no more foreign designer clothes. They wanted to knit in the traditional Icelandic way and also build community that way. So they made a very conscious choice. And in the book, they're kind of an outlier in having insight that actually leads to real change. Um, what in a way is more common is the feeling of the genie being out of the bottle. And this is in Shanghai, which I started photographing when privatization happened and wealth started accruing in, in 2000. And this is a CEO who has all Versace furniture in her bedroom. And she likes to play golf, which is a status sport there. But it's really not so much about the golf. It's more about the networking. And she belongs to three golf clubs, which cost $50,000 each just for the initial entry. And in Hong Kong, there's a solid gold toilet, 24 karat toilet, where people come from mainland China to be photographed sitting on the toilet. <laughs> and, uh, and, and the um, kind of American ideas loom large in this accumulation of wealth. And in this place where revolution had leveled class and status, there was a kind of mad grab for luxury and the icons of wealth. And this is a CEO, outside, a, bi a billionaire outside of Shanghai who built a replica of the White House. And in his backyard, out of the Oval Office, this was his view. <laughs> so I'm going to finish on the new education in China, which is kind of wealth 2.0, where people don't just want designer brands anymore. They want culture, and this is an etiquette class where you learn the proper pronunciation of the foreign brands and many other useful skills, which I'll show you in this last clip. How to eat a banana elegantly with a knife and fork. And the $16,000 that it costs to take this course, is that a lot for the client? Everybody who's taken the class has said it's worth every penny spent. So I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>
you know, when you go through the 600 pictures and read the 150 interviews, you're going to see yourself in there too. Yeah. But if anyone should be armed to the teeth now to be able to resist all these temptations, it should be you. But still, you you feel the pull of that consumer culture. Well, I think it's that pull and relating to the subjects that actually allows me to document. And I've always kind of done that. Like when I did girl culture, I was really relying on my own insecurities as a teenager to kind of point the way. Mm -hmm. And when I did fast forward, I was also kind of leaning in on my own ambivalence mm -hmm. and kind of being an insider and outsider when I was in high school. And, um, Are you still an insider and outsider when you meet these people and try to gain access to their lives? I th yeah, do I think you act I like am. you're one of them, or do you act like you're well, emphatically no, not mean, one of them? I'm not one of them. I'm a journalist. I'm a photographer, but I think I've been in it long enough that I can speak the language too. Like mm -hmm. Jackie and I had a very close relationship, mm -hmm. and Jackie really understood too what the project's about. I mean, mm -hmm. the thing that you find when you read these stories is that the subjects really are the truth tellers and they're often the ones kind of telling it like it is and I'm really often getting my ideas not just from what I'm observing but also from their interpretation of what's going on. Um, so yeah, I think I'm, a, I'm often kind of walking that line and, and some of the access is also I've always worked as a photojournalist. So sometimes I'm, when I met Jackie Siegel, I was photographing Donatella Versace for Elle so I'm kind of, you know, in there as an image maker too. And mm -hmm. so this book was really a chance for me to kind of step back from that and kind of put it all together in, in really the context that yep. I wanted to see it. Mm -hmm. Just practically speaking, how do you get access? Does Donatella Versace introduce you to someone who introduces you to someone? Uh, by now, of course, they know your work, so they have a better idea. But getting access to these people is... is, is Probably not easy. I mean, working on the access is probably 95% of really? what I do. Really? Ah, yeah. Ah. It's, I mean, I'm often spending three weeks somewhere and making the picture on the last day ah. or spending, you know, three years in something and mm -hmm. making the best, best pictures at the end. So, what um, motivate these people to cooperate? Are they, is it exhibitionism or is it because they feel that you're, getting deeper than just the surface of their lives? Are they opening up to you in an emotional way? I think it's all of those things, mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, there were people in this story, like um, there was a woman, Fiona, in Ireland who was married to the person they call the Bernie Madoff of Ireland, and she had been hounded by the tabloids and had never spoken to anybody, and she spoke to me because she thought it was a kind of deeper, more substantive look, mm -hmm. but also, I think she wanted to tell her story and hadn't really found the right venue. I mean, I think that people do really want to tell their stories. And when you read the stories, there's a lot of pain, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of longing in the stories. So I think that there is something um, cathartic about telling it too. And could they also open up to you perhaps because it is very lonely living in the biggest house of America, 90,000 square feet. I think they get around by Segway, right? <laughs> they have Segways in the house. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think for Jackie, there was an element of companionship. I think in her case, there was also an element of exhibitionism. She loved being in pictures. She loved being filmed. And, um, and when they started, they were very proud of building the biggest house in America. And by the time things got really tough, I was kind of part of the family, part of the furniture. And they didn't really see... Um, David never saw himself as doing anything wrong. He more saw it as a kind of valiant struggle that I was there to document. Mm. It just didn't end in the way that he wanted it to end. He did ultimately sue you. He did. It was a very uh, revealing kind of um, piece. Um, I think in the New York Times review, they said a lawsuit is the best compliment in America. <laughs> but Jackie... Our litigious <laughs> nation... Jackie loved the movie, came to Sundance where it premiered, kissed, blew kisses to the audience, and then promoted the movie for a year, going to London and Helsinki and everywhere, while David was suing at the same time. <laughs> um, he said he really liked the movie, he just didn't like the ending, and he actually hired out a theater in Florida, bought out the theater, brought all his friends there in a party bus, and introduced the movie but he said he just didn't like the ending.
And that was enough reason to sue you? It wasn't that you had misrepresented him or? No, I think he did it for business reasons, but he didn't, he didn't win, so he had to pay all the legal bills. But I think for his purpose, it actually kind of made sense business-wise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I could easily take up the whole evening with my questions, but I'm sure there are a lot of questions uh, uh, among the audience. So good, I will come to you with a microphone. I'll be right back. During my classes, I, I taught about what uh, this documentary series called um, um, The Century of the Self by the uh, BBC. Remember that long series about how um, status and mass culture and consumerism were the way how to have a post-war society rebuild itself. And this is kind of the African where it totally overtopped and the crisis in the economy and everything resulting from it. So I, my question now to you is, do you, did you follow those documentaries? Are they relating to you? Um, does that way of thinking speak to you? How? Yeah. Um, sorry, but I don't know the documentaries, so I can't really speak to it. I mean, I can say that um, I, that in the 70s, from it, that we kind of went from a, uh, making things, society of production, to a society of consumption, and that was kind of, in a way, the beginning of this story, but I don't know. Or, you know, like, direct, direct all this social energy to become this picture-perfect middle class with the white picket fence. That was the image through media, through uh, campaigning or ad campaigning. It was like a thorough indoctrination of this is the kind of perfect woman, this is the perfect family, mm -hmm. the man getting into the beauty car every day, going to the office, that's the, you know, the madman imagery. And now we're going through a celebrity as this idea. Right. Lifestyle. I think it's exactly the same. It's like another stage of the same thing. And one of the, you know, things I was looking at was in a way kind of capitalism going on overdrive through, like, that was traditional advertising, but now with the internet, with social media, we're inundated with advertising all the time and actually we're branding ourselves all the time in social media. And so in a way, this was a process of just everything becoming ever so much more so. And the thing about the, the look at girls was it was really about how body image insecurities can be mined to sell stuff and how if you make people feel less than and have a feeling of inadequacy, they become great consumers and once they buy something, then they want something else. And so it creates this addictive cycle. And a lot of this work is really about addiction at its heart. Hello. Um, Lauren, uh, I understand in the course of making Queen of Versailles, you became close to Jackie. I also understand that after the movie premiered, there was a, a personal tragedy in her life, mm. resulting in the death of one of her children. Um, I just wondered uh, whether that was an uncomfortable experience or whether your friendship endured that very real tragedy in her life. Well, it was really, really sad when Victoria died of an, a drug overdose and Jackie and I corresponded about that, but it was much, much later than the film and actually in the intervening time, we had this lawsuit that got resolved by our winning the lawsuit. So I would say that um, definitely kind of put a little crimp in the friendship. <laughs> so um, that was already kind of in progress. I mean, I, I felt just, you know, horrible, like anybody would for a mother losing her child. The thing about Victoria in the movie is she's kind of the light of the movie. She's the one who stands up for her mom, who stands up against her dad. And, um, and so it was just kind of tragedy upon tragedy. Hello. Um, I know of your work only through your brilliant documentary, uh, Thin. I, re I find that a very touching film, and uh, I know a lot of people also do. And it's in some ways similar to what I see here tonight, but in many ways it's very different. And I wondered if you might talk about that film a bit and how it might fit into the narrative of, of the work that you do. 
Thin was a movie I made about eating disorders. It was my first film, and it takes place in an all-female residential clinic in South Florida. And it was kind of like, it, I, it, it built on girl culture. I kind of got there from the body image side. Um, but once I was there, it was really like going into the heart of darkness of mental illness, and in a way, very unlike my other work, because in the end, it wasn't about popular culture at all. But I was really interested in, in kind of getting there and afterwards in this relationship between the mainstream and the pathological and how eating disorders are a very real and very tragic mental illness, but they also kind of exaggerate and look like normative behavior in a more extreme form. And I was really, I made a book also called Thin and a social historian, Joan Brumberg, told me um, psychopathologies come and go, but they always tell us about the time period in which they're produced. And that really resonated for me. And I actually, um, I didn't really make the connection between that and this work until my film teacher from college who was helping with me with Queen of Versailles said that all of my work is about addiction. And that kind of rang true for me because like there's a scene in Queen of Versailles where Jackie is already hit by the crash. They're already having financial problems. She goes to Walmart to buy cheap Christmas presents, and she ends up coming out with eight shopping carts just full of junk. And that really spoke to the kind of addic like addictive nature of consumerism and also the kind of irrational part of it. And so in a lot of the work, a lot of these stories in Generation Wealth, there is a kind of sense of filling a kind of hole, um, a kind of emotional hole with stuff and how that, you know, kind of never leads anywhere except for rock bottom. Um, and thank you so much for sharing these amazing pictures with us. I was wondering about sort of the idea of the moral compass, which you mentioned briefly and especially with the Icelandic sort of example that, you know, they sort of felt that they had gone too far in the wrong direction and they turned around, but somehow... And started knitting. Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> what about the others? I mean, are there different degrees in which people uh, came to these kind of insights that maybe they did overstep some boundaries and they should get back to traditional values and hard work and these kind of issues? Or, or is it now that you mentioned, is it that they saw it as an illness, like an addiction, and they're passive victims? And it just happened to them somehow? Uh, so I'm wondering. I think there are a lot of stories of insight and stories of redemption in the, in the book. And in a way, that's why the interviews are so important, because you kind of need those voices to express that. Even Florian Holm, in a way, is kind of the, the, the wisest storyteller as the person who really became kind of the devil and then lived to tell the story. Um, so I think that there are these moments of insight that in a way give us hope. Um, and I think the question, and this really comes true with Queen of Versailles and um, also with my final chapter, Make It Rain, which is about the strip club in Atlanta and a club in Las Vegas where people spend $50,000 a night on bottle service and this is post crash. So it was kind of like this feeling of dancing on the deck of the Titanic. So I think the question that is raised is really um, do these insights endure beyond the period of suffering? And with, with David and Jackie Siegel, David has all these amazing kind of insights at the end of the movie and is the person to really speak the lessons, saying we shouldn't have built so big, I should have been happy with fewer resorts, no one is without guilt. And then after the crash, or after he starts recovering and his business comes back, he buys back the house and still now it's five years later, he's still saying he's gonna finish it. <laughs> Hi, um, I was so inspired by your Always Like a Girl campaign that I started a club at my school called Like a Girl. Oh. And um, <laughs> we raise uh, money for um, education for girls in developing countries and access to sanitary products in developing countries. And I was, uh, a lot of people at my school were really engaged and interested in the topic, and I had a few others who weren't as interested and who actually... Uh, they were boys. <laughs> Not all of them, actually. But I, my question, so for you, is do you have any tips or ideas on how I can destigmatize female empowerment? Um, well, it sounds like... a small like subject. <laughs> <laughs> any, any, just in your opinion, 
any ideas that you may have? I mean, it sounds like you're doing a great job. You're yeah. using that piece to kind of make your own yeah. work and make your own statement and spread that message, and I think that's amazing. Um, I mean, Like a Girl, for this very reason, is an example of the positive power of a lot of the things that come out kind of in a negative light in this work in terms of the power of advertising and what the internet and what social media and what that conversation can do. And so this was a viral spot sponsored by a brand always that kind of showed what Like a Girl meant and how it had become an insult. And it started out as a small piece, and it was and it, it ended up being seen by over 200 million people. So, it um, it, it moved the dial with people like you, and I really appreciate that. It was like probably one of the most gratifying pieces that I've ever done. It must be wonderful, Lauren, hearing about this kind of spin-off here that you couldn't have known about that you've inspired this young woman to go down this path. How old are you? I'm 16. What's your name? AC. And where do you go to school? The International, S there's actually a lot of my teachers are here. <laughs> the, uh, the, <laughs> the International School of Amsterdam. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. You've really inspired me and the project at my school has really changed my life and the way I look at everything. Well, so. Thank you. <laughs> so I'd like to question like about your opinion on a big topic what do you think causes um, a lot of eating disorders and a lot of societies for girls yeah. like why like what's the main point of why it happens so much yeah I mean that's a really hard question and I've talked to a lot of doctors and no one knows exactly but it seems like it's a mix of things from well one doctor said um, society that that biology makes the gun and society pulls the trigger so that some people have tendencies toward eating disorders whether it's a uh, genetic or family dynamics um, or personality like compul like obsessive compulsive perfectionistic kind of personality but that we live in a culture that's constantly bombarding us with kind of being thin is being the perfect girl so it's it just becomes a combination of things. And it's, it's, it's so common when I did the movie, and I haven't stayed as much in that world since, but it was one in seven girls suffer from an eating disorder. So it's kind of this huge and very common, very, very hard illness. Hi. Hi. Um, I also saw your uh, piece for Always Like a Girl. And um, I was actually wondering, have you ever thought about doing it the other way around for boys? Like, for instance, you've been working with a lot of rappers and this big masculine alpha community there. And I was wondering if you ever thought about doing it the other way around, making men feel comfortable to be vulnerable. Okay, so show me now, if I ask you, like in the beginning of the movie, what does it mean to throw like a boy? What does that look like? I don't think there's a difference between throwing like a girl and throwing like a boy, because it's a uh, it's a uh, yeah physical thing. Yeah. But do you think boys have a different image of? Yeah, I do. Especially in mainstream hip hop media, boys do have a complete different image than girls do. And actually, one of the um, people in the new aging section who does um, a lot of Botox and collagen and injectables, one of her biggest clients is a rapper, um, and men are kind of one of the most biggest areas for growth and plastic surgery. So I think that in the end, like global capitalism is gender blind because it's really just looking for people to sell to. So I think that this is an area of a lot of change. And as the mother of two boys, I, I've i seen some of it. Like I didn't used to think I was, I got that question before. I didn't used to think I was the person to tell that story. But now that I've raised two boys, I'm, I'm wondering, because I think it is a really interesting subject. And um, both of my boys saw this commercial for Axe, do you know this cologne, mm -hmm. where the girls just kind of fall down, and they both wanted this product. 
But I think instead of getting better for girls, it's getting harder for boys because the commodification, you know, of human beings is kind of pervasive. If you make it, we'll watch it, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Yeah, I see you. Hi. Hi, Hi Casey. Hi. And my Lauren, thank you for sharing your view with the world. My question is, we live in an era of ubiquitous images. How do you set your work apart and or do you feel the need to protect it? Um, well, I'll start with the second question. I mean, protecting it, I think, is really important. And I actually, um, my husband has a photo agency called Institute. And a lot of what he does is kind of making sure the integrity of the work stays as it's published in different places, not just for me, but for other documentary photographers. And also keeping one's copyright has been a really important thing for photography since the 50s and is the only way that I could do a project this way where I could kind of take a historical and longitudinal perspective. And in film, that's a lot more rare, that generally things are work for hire and you don't own your own film. And so with Queen of Versailles and Kids and Money, we actually kept those. And so that is something, I think that protection is really important, but ultimately, the reason I do a book and a show like this, and I'm also making a feature length film now, Generation Wealth, is that it's the place where I can fully control the work. Um, a lot of times when I'm making the work, I'm working for a magazine or I'm kind of on the way to do something where that's how I, sometimes it helps me with access, sometimes it helps me with research, it's really essential to making the work, but I don't have total control about how it's used. I mean, as I've kind of, grown up, I've gotten a little bit more influence, and so I feel like people listen to me a little bit more, but it is up to them in the end if they do. So I think that's really important. In terms of, I mean, being an image maker and being kind of part of an image society as a photojournalist, as somebody making pictures for mass media too, is always a place I have loved to kind of live on the edge of. Like I. I love to kind of make pictures about eating disorders and have them be published in People magazine where there was a 10 page spread. And sometimes there was, it was hard for the girls who said, well, how, why are you doing that? Nicole Ritchie is super thin and on the cover of that. But I feel like, you know, that is where you want to hit people. It's not preaching to the converted in a art bookstore or in a magazine. It's really like, like a girl, one of the best things that ever happened to me was when it played on the Super Bowl. It was the first time feminine protection was at the Super Bowl. And so it's amazing for, you know, to, to have the opportunity to be in that venue. I think that anybody who reads the book and goes through it is, is I don't think there's a question of it sensationalizing wealth or glorifying it. I think that um, you might, buy it because of the gold silk cover, but if you read through, um, you're gonna go on a pretty dark journey. Speaking of uh, dark journeys, um, I, I think your work is brilliant and incredibly important. The mirror that you hold up to global capitalist culture, uh, the reflection is one of unremitting horror. I'm curious to know what you think is coming next uh, are the gates of hell just going to close <laughs> and leave us here? Or is there something um. beyond this? Are there forms of uh, almost the equivalent of indigenous resistance that people are going to start to offer? Uh, or is the current administration in the United States just a bellwether that it's the end? <laughs> well, I just, I have to, as I answer this question, I'm just going to illustrate it with the pictures that I didn't get a chance to show. Um, about the gates of hell. But, I mean, I think that, um, I, you know, I don't know where we're going. I was as surprised as anyone when Trump was elected as president, but in a lot of ways, um, that story was in the pictures and the values that he represented was in the work. And so, um, I do feel like uh, it's unsustainable, and that's why I spent four years kind of putting together the work, and, and it's unsustainable environmentally, but not just that, also in terms of family and community and kind of morality. And, um, and so I think that, 
you know, the, the, the point of the work for me, and, and there are a lot of insights and stories of redemption by the characters, is to just kind of give us a chance to see the matrix and be a little bit more in control of our choices. But I, c I couldn't tell you what's next. Um, I mean, what I the question is, is feminism going to give new answers? Um, well, you probably want to choose who's asking the questions, Tracy. But I'll just say that, you know, the new feminism, a lot of the new feminism that I've documented in this book is empowerment through from selling your body to being very provocative. So I think it's a really kind of in the matrix kind of questionable kind of empowerment. Thanks for your invigorating talk. Um, all your work, did it help you or did it inspire you uh, how to raise your two boys? And that's in the next movie. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it caused, it caused a lot of reflection along the way. Um, but I'll just tell you one story um, that happened a couple weeks ago. I was um, with my 10-year-old and we were on a long drive and we stopped at Target, the superstore, to just use the bathroom and get a coffee. And while I was there, all of a sudden, I picked up a cart and I started like buying things that we needed. And my son was like, Mom, we didn't come here to shop. What are you doing? And I was like, well, we're here. I need this and you need this. So then I go to pay for the items and I put one item on the self-serve register and it comes up $52. And Gabriel says, what is that? And I said, it's face cream. And he said, put it back. <laughs> Object lesson number one. <laughs> Anybody else who would like to make a contribution? Why don't you come into the light so people can see you? Hello. Hi, I'm just curious to uh, know what you think about or how you think about your book in terms of you're covering consumer culture, and now, in a way, you're contributing to it. So I'd like to, I'd like to know how you think about it. Well, I mean, I think I've always used the medium to talk about the medium. So, like in my early work, when I was working in transparencies and making Cibachrome prints, I always used shiny surfaces and very saturated colors and kind of the language and aesthetic of the popular culture to comment and also critique the popular culture. I've always kind of like gone into that language. So, you know, I think you're always kind of dealing with this. When I made the film about eating disorders, there's there's always it's a it's a disease of social contagion. So there's always a chance that somebody is gonna use your work as a how-to manual. On the other hand, there is a lot of how-to manuals available on the internet. So if somebody wants to use it that way, you know, there's plenty of information. And so um, you know, I think that this book is, um, I mean, it would be wonderful if it was like a, a popular item that people were buying at Target, but it's a 500 page book with 600 pictures and a lot of writing in it. So I feel invigorated by being here in Amsterdam where you're so intellectual and engaged and kind of get it all. But uh, it will be interesting to see how many people you know, buy it in the States. Somebody asked me, a journalist asked me today if I thought Donald Trump was going to buy the book. And uh, <laughs> actually, I don't. And I think it would, I, I hear he's not much of a reader, so. <laughs> Tell me something new, Laura. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have two questions. We have five more minutes. So I hope it's OK with you if I take those for my last two questions. Um, Two things. One thing that really struck me, you said growing up, and uh, we grew up in the same kind of culture, about 12 years apart, and uh, America in the age of our parents certainly was, as you said, thrifty, frugal, work hard, get ahead, and now that has been atomized by the, uh, let's say, the, the culture of bling. But what I... The only good thing I can really think to say about this is that it seems to completely transcend all sorts of ethnic and class boundaries. There's a whole new transcendent moral ethic which seems to be not at all plagued by all the normal tensions of American society. 
Yeah, I mean, in some ways, it, it, it does become a kind of classless society, especially yeah. like compared to Europe and a kind of society of opportunity where, I mean, the thing I loved about working in the strip club Magic City was it was this kind of beautifully transparent and trans transactional kind of like microcosm of the American dream mm -hmm. where somebody like Future can start in the ghetto and become a multimillionaire and kind of have that happen. Um, on the other hand, I think that, and I saw that in the early work when I was doing Fast Forward, I also, my first news story was the LA riots. And when I shot the LA riots, I was actually in neighborhoods that I had never been to as a kid. And I saw kind of how separated LA was and kind of how people were living in silos. And yet the kids knew each other. They knew each other's music. They, knew, they, they copied each other. The rich kids were copying the kids in the inner city. The inner city were copying the rich kids. They were kind of connecting in a lot of different ways that on one hand is kind of positive in a shared culture. And on the other hand, it's like everybody's valuing Versace. And that was something that you know went from Jackie Siegel and went to, to China. I mean, I think the thing about Jackie Siegel that people found refreshing and, and why they kind of identified with her is she did not have any airs about being rich. She was completely down to earth mm -hmm. and generous and friendly and approachable. And so um, I think her kind of rags to riches story, like she kind of kept the humility that she grew up with. But, um, but then again, you see kind of the, the picture of what success means mm -hmm. in those terms. Mm -hmm. Um, this goes back to the question of the gentleman uh, about what's next. Uh, you show us in Technicolor how consumerism has taken over and replaced the American dream. Is this something? Is there is there a way back? Can we ever go back to that ethic of um, hard work and earning what you what you acquire? I mean, I think that part of the problem is that we don't have the same kind of social mobility that we used to mm -hmm. have, and we also have such a concentration of wealth. So like post-crash, there's been a recovery for some, and, and for most, there hasn't been. Um, and I think that's part of you know the, the rise of Trump story. But um, I think that Is Trump a product of this culture? I think so, yeah. I think he's kind of the apotheosis of generation wealth. and. I think that until there's send him a signed copy. You never know. <laughs> I think until there's you know that feeling that hard work and uh, and education is both an education is attainable and hard work will lead you somewhere meaningful. I think that has to happen for people to want to engage in that way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, 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 I'm hugely impressed and the and the and the fruit of all these years of labor and apparently there's now a, a movie in the making. Any idea when that will appear? Uh, in the fall. This fall? This fall. Will you come back if we screen it? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait. I can't thank you enough for this window onto a world that, that we don't know in, and yet which we do. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. to the table where the books are being sold for the signing, and please leave the um, corridor open so that she can get to the books. Um, I wanted to uh, tell you that on June 20, oh God, I'm gonna get the date wrong. Martha, help. June 21. Our next event is with Martin Ford, who is uh, going to be part of our technology series, and Martin Ford has written an extraordinary book about robotization and automatization and the um, extent to which robots are completely changing our whole field of work. And uh, the question is whether there will be any work as we have known it so far in the future. It's going to be um, another real shocker. So <laughs> hope to see you then. Sign up for our newsletter. Come back soon. Bring a friend and tell everybody how wonderful the John Adams Institute is.